Welcome to the Healthy, Wealthy, and Smart Podcast. Each week, we interview the best and brightest in physical therapy, wellness, and entrepreneurship. We give you cutting-edge information you need to live your best life, healthy, wealthy, and smart. The information in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Karen Litzy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I am your host, Karen Litzy, and today's episode is brought to you by NetHealth. So if you're interested in a free opportunity to check in with the latest thoughts of other rehab leaders, NetHealth has you covered. They have created the brand new Rehab Therapy Operational Best Practices Forum. You'll see stats on the community members already involved, plus some new polls just launched, and I'd love for you to weigh in. What can you expect that will benefit you? Write-ups and white papers from leading edge performers. There are polls, surveys, benchmarking calculators, videos, podcasts, and more. I personally believe that a better connected rehab therapy profession has the power to help more people. So jump in, subscribe, and join the conversations today. You can find the Rehab Therapy Operational Best Practices Forum at www.nethealth.com slash healthy. And we will have that link in the show notes. Now on to today's episode. I am so happy to have on today's episode Dr. Jonathan Mulholland. Dr. Mulholland has earned both his bachelor's degree in exercise science and his doctor of chiropractic degree. He holds two postgraduate qualifications in sports chiropractic, in addition to being a certified strength and conditioning specialist. Dr. Mulholland has acted as the chiropractic consultant for the United States Olympic Training Center in Lake Placid and has traveled extensively as one of the team chiropractors for the U.S. bobsled and skeleton teams. He has worked with multiple world championship events in a variety of sports and has treated athletes from dozens of different countries. He was also the sports medicine and performance enhancement consultant for the New Zealand cycling team at the 2012 Summer Olympic Games in London, where he helped the team win two Olympic medals. He lectures regularly around the world and treats patients at his private clinic when he isn't traveling. He currently lives in Plattsburgh, New York with his wife and two children when he spends most of the year trying to stay warm. True story. So in today's episode, we talk about how health professionals can get involved with Olympic athletes, his experience working in the Olympic Village, common misconceptions about the chiropractic and physical therapy professions, and key habits that high-level athletes have developed to enhance their performance. So a huge thank you to Jonathan for this great interview, and everyone enjoy. Hey, Jonathan, welcome to the podcast. I'm happy to have you on. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and in your bio that I read separately because it's annoying to have you sit there while I read through your bio. Um, We talked about your work with Olympic athletes. And this is something that I know a lot of, let's say, physical therapists, chiropractors, ATCs might, might be on their bucket list. So can you let the listeners know kind of the best ways for us to get involved in working with Olympic athletes? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, you know, and this is my story, so I'm sure there's more ways, but I can only speak how I did it. So brief background. So I live up in the middle of nowhere. I live up near Lake Placid, which has a pretty big name. Uh, Lake Placid, New York hosted, you know, a few different winter Olympics, still has World Cup bobsledding and Nordic skiing and ski jumping and all this cool stuff. And so I grew up in an Olympic house. I was in uh, at the Lake Placid Games in 1980, I was in the village during the big win of the hockey team. Not at the game, but in the village. Uh, I was born right down the road, about 15 miles down the road. Um, my father was actually an Olympic bobsledder in the 70s uh, in Japan. So I literally grew up in a bobsled house. My mother bobsledded. My sister and I grew up bobsledding. So it was kind of a unique part of the yeah, world. Yeah, that is definitely unique. You don't usually hear like you come from a long line of bobsledders. No, no. And it's funny, you know, not to get down the rabbit hole, but to give her some props. My mother's a a lifelong retired kindergarten, first grade teacher, five foot two. And in the early seventies, women were not allowed to drive a bobsled from the top of the track. They thought this is early seventies, late sixties, you know, women couldn't handle the G forces was the thought they'd pass out, they'd get injured, they, whatever. So my mother was actually the first woman in North America to get her pilot's license to drive a bobsled from the top of the track. So kind of this little independent streak. And um, so anyway, long story short, 
I kind of bleed the Olympics. So I love it. So how I got involved, I think the first thing, regardless of your profession, is you have to have the skill set. You've got to know certain types of a, you know, manual therapy, whether that's active release, whether that's instrument assisted work, you kind of need a big toolbox because to get your foot in the door, if you get your foot in the door, you start working at an Olympic training center or doing rotations or, or working with teams, you kind of have to work with the athletes and whether it's a technique you think works or you think is worthwhile or you think you know what's better for the athlete it doesn't really matter at that level. You know, it, it humbles us a bit as clinicians, but we have a saying, you know, when you work with elite athletes, if the athlete thinks it works, it works, <laughs> period. Um, and as long as you know it's not doing them harm, you can think it's a bunch of garbage, but if that athlete thinks it gets them better ready to prepare to, to compete, you better know how to do it or at least fake it well. So I think just improving the size of your toolbox young is step number one. Now, physically getting your foot in the door the USOC, the US Olympic Committee, has volunteer rotational programs. So if you go on the USOC website, I, I don't know it off the top of my head. Or That's just, okay. We'll find it. We'll have a link to it in the show yeah, notes. Yeah, just Google it. Um, you know, volunteer rotation, medical rotation for the USOC. Basically, they require everybody regardless. Now, they're looking for massage therapists. They're looking for chiros. They're looking for PTs. They're looking for athletic trainers. Um, they will require that you do a two-week rotation. That is a volunteer unpaid rotation. You go for, I think it's still 14 days at one of the three Olympic training centers, the big one in Colorado Springs, the smaller ones in Lake Placid and Southern California, Chula Vista. Um, it's basically an, an opportunity for them to see how you work. Um, you get to work with whoever, whatever athletes are in-house. They start working in with the staff trainers and physios and stuff. And basically, it's kind of an on-the-job interview. Uh, they want to see how well you play with others. Uh, can you, are you a jerk? Are you an egomaniac? Do you, are you just faking it? Have you taken all these courses but have no real skill set with your hands? Um, you better know what you're doing. And once you get your two weeks in, that's the foot in the door. So if you do a good job, if they like you, then the hope is you can start to get called to work events. Hey, we need coverage for a smaller less important event. You work a couple of those. Then maybe you come up to a, more of a national championship style event with the goal that I've been lucky enough to do over many, many years is world championship events. And then hopefully, you know, for a lot of people, the end game is getting called to work in Olympics. Yeah. And I, I have to say, I never knew about this 14 day volunteer thing. So that's mm -hmm. a really great tip for people. And again, like I said, we'll have the link to the USOC in the show notes for this episode. So don't worry if you didn't have a chance to, to write yeah. it down. And I can just say from, again, I did my two weeks way back in 2008. It was actually during the Beijing Olympics. I was out in Colorado Springs for two weeks and it's a fantastic experience. I mean, it, it's, it's tough because you're not getting paid. So if you're an older clinician or, you know, in, in a practice for a few years, you're not getting paid for a couple of weeks, uh, you know, time away from family and all that, but it's mandatory and it's, it's a huge learning experience and, and you just got to do it. Yeah. And it sounds like if they like you that you'll get called to different events. And I'm glad that you pointed out that just because you do two weeks there doesn't mean the next thing you're going to is the Olympics. Like you have no. to put your time in. And I think a lot of people think, that you don't have to do that for some reason. Yeah. Like I said, I've been, in, this is my 18th year. I graduated chiropractic school way back in 2000. Um, you know, and I worked my first Olympics, ironically, back in 2012, the London Games. Uh, I was 2010, I was at the Paralympics. I was the only chiro in USA Medical. And the ironic thing, and maybe a story we can get into in a, in a bit, I was actually not even working for Team USA at the London Games. I was actually working for Team New Zealand, the cycling team. So it's kind of funny how things get twisted over many years of working and, and you meet different people in different parts of the world and doors open. So, Awesome. Well, it's good to know too that you can work for other countries if they, if you kind of make those connections. Yeah. I mean, the moral of the story, and I, I like I said, I do some continuing ed lecturing uh, around the country at times. And sometimes we get a lot of students and students come up and ask me these exact questions. Oh, cool. I looked at your bio. How do you, you know, I want to work in Olympics. I want to work with the pro teams. And my, the moral of the story is first, you got to just do a kick-ass job. <laughs> Be a really good clinician. You know, in your own practice, whether you're working for someone or working for yourself, 
you've got to be a good clinician because that luck is going to run out quickly if you get a foot in the door and then you do a really crappy job and the athletes can't stand you. Um, so be a good, have a good skill set and be a good person. Uh, treat people with respect, treat them well. And those are lessons we all learn in clinic, um, you hopefully. know, working our practice. Hopefully. That's right. It's not a magic formula for clinical success. Be nice. Don't keep people waiting and have a decent skill set. Sounds like piece of cake to me. Now, like you said, you're, you're a chiropractor. Um, I am a physical therapist. And there are a lot of similarities and differences between our professions. If you go on social media, you would think it was like the War of the Roses. Yeah. Um, but there actually are a lot of similarities. So I'd like to first dive into maybe some myths that chiropractors think about PTs, and then I'll talk about some myths that PTs think about chiropractors, and we'll hash this out a little bit. And then we'll go into what does that mean when you work with these elite athletes? So yeah. let's have you first. So from a chiropractic st standpoint or viewpoint, what are some myths about physical therapy that you see? So I want to preface this by saying we're building bridges here, aren't we? We're going to sing some like Kumbaya later or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, of course. So no, this is not to be like a divisive, oh. but I think it's important that you can have people who have more similarities than differences, I would assume. Yes. Um, but yet when you see these arguments and things yeah. happen on social media and, and it just gets a little out of control. So. Yeah. And so it legitimately, you know, as we, we were speaking briefly before we started recording, is there are great chiros, there are great PTs, there are great MDs, and there are crappy chiros and crappy PTs and crappy MDs. So, you know, stereotypes can sometimes be stereotypes for a reason, um, you know, but I think we typically those stereotypes tend to default to kind of the, the lower common denominator of the profession. Um, but to answer your question, as a clinician for, for almost 20 years now, um, I think the stereotypes we have with some of the physios is over-reliance on passive modalities, you know, kind of old school, you know, three times a week getting hot packs and ice packs and stim and ultrasound and sometimes um, not putting patient care into the patient's hands earlier, um, kind of that over-reliance on the passive modalities where instead of maybe front loading them with, you know, their own homework early on that they don't necessarily have to come in three times a week, that they can be performing these stuff at home. Um, that would be number one. Number two that I see a lot, and this is kind of, I'm setting you up for the anti Cairo uh, comments in a minute. I think this is one of these common, we're on opposite ends of the spectrum. I think as a stereotype, I think PTs tend to give patients too many exercises too early. You know, they send them home with 45 minutes worth of uh, 15 different exercises of what you and I know. They're not going to do any of them if you give them too many. And I think the stereotype for Kairos is the exact opposite, that all they just do adjust, 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 and don't give enough home exercises. Um, I think somewhere in the middle is obviously, you know, the sweet spot. So those are my big two. Yeah, and I will say that in my early years, I definitely gave too many exercises yeah. It was too much, too much at one time. And then, yeah, they didn't do anything. Now I give like one or two yep. and then we kind of take it from there because we know that people can really handle one or two. Yes. Um, so I was, I fully admit a hundred percent guilty of that in my early years. Um, now from, I think from a physical therapy standpoint to a chiropractic standpoint, one of the uh, biggest myths or or gripes, I guess, from a physical therapist about a chiropractor would be that chiropractors use the subluxation theory to explain every ailment for a person. Yep. So um, you have a child that has an ear infection, well, it's because they're subluxed and then they are, you yep. know, they have to come in and they have to be manipulated or adjusted in order to get rid of an ear infection or whether it be aches or pains or what have you all over the body. So I think that's number one. And then the second one would be almost, it's, so, it's almost like the same thing that Kairos may think of PTs, but this over-reliance on manipulation, that that's the only thing that can help the person. And so they're kind of addicted to the chiropractor and they have to go once a week for the rest of their life. Yep. 
right? So I yep. think it's the same thing, um, is that over-reliance, it might not be on passive modalities like ultrasound, heat, and stim, but it's the reliance on the, the only way I'm going to feel better is if I get this adjustment. Exactly. Yeah. 100% um, agree. Yeah. So we have, like you said, good and bad PTs, chiros, MDs, lawyers, you name it. There's a good and bad of everything. So I think there are, I agree, there are certainly those PTs who are relying, who are still doing ultrasound, which come on, like, don't we know that that just doesn't work? Yeah. Like, yeah. research shows that, you know, and, and that reliance on the passive modalities that I see quite a bit, the three times a week, thankfully, I think is starting to disappear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you're really getting therapists to be a lot more thoughtful about their uh, plan of care. Plus, you have insurance company regulations and things like that where you can't have three times a week anymore. Yeah. You know, you have to sort of space it out. Um, and yeah, like I said, the too many exercises too early, totally guilty of that in the past. But now how would you respond to the sub, let's say the subluxation yeah. theory and how that might not be a thing? No, I... So I am going to, I'll, I'll preface this by saying I am going, I agree hundred percent with you. Um, it's nonsense. It's garbage. It's hogwash. And I'm going to irritate, you know, a good 50% of my fellow professionals by saying this, but I, it's just, I'm a science guy. You've, I've spoken to you, you know, we've known each other a short time. I'm an evidence-based practitioner. It's what I lecture on. It's how I practice in my practice. I want to be able to pull studies, explain with confidence when a patient asks, what the heck are you doing to me? And why are you doing that? I want to be able to do that. So what you described, this whole subluxation I issue with chiros is the biggest problem, in my opinion, with the chiropractic profession is the fact that a general, you know, Joe Blow off the street going into a chiro has no clue what to expect. None. It's the inconsistency within our own profession is the biggest harm to us as a profession and all in my opinion always has been you guys as pts unbelievably and you might disagree because you know it but you're unbelievably compared to us well organized the apta is a massive organ yeah well it's all different bars you know what i mean compared we look at you guys as a profession saying how come we can't have the numbers how come we can't have the political power that the apt do, a, apta does as far as lobbying and as far as, you know, uh, lobbying with insurance companies and getting, you know, right to treat and this and that. So we look as an outsider, we're a much smaller group and it is the biggest issue with the chiropractic. You have these old school chiros and they are still a big chunk of us that believe in exactly what you said, that this magical subluxation, that they full spine x-ray everybody, they look and say, oh, your C5 is left laterally flexed, your L3 is tilted this way and rotated and blah, 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 blah. And we're gonna adjust that spine straight. We've debunked that so many times in studies that guess what? The way I explain it to patients that come in from one of those chiropractors, it's so frustrating. My 18 years of practice, I've probably done more de-educating patients that have come from those type of chiros than I have actually giving them exercises and it's so frustrating. But basically I tell you, They've done studies where they look at people in pain. They shoot a full spine x-ray. These chiros adjust the malalignments, if you want to call them, of these crookedness of these vertebrae. And guess what? A minute later, they hop off the table and they feel better. They immediately re-x-ray them again. And guess what? It looks, it looks exactly the same. The same. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Yet they feel way better. So that was eye-opening. That was like decades ago. And so I tell people, we're not realigning a subluxation. We are simply put getting the stuck stuff unstuck. We have joints that might be restricted or locked up or call it what it's all semantics, call it what you want. Um, but that's all we're doing is getting the stuck stuff unstuck. Now, chiros that are evidence-based like me, that's how we talk and that's how we explain it to our patients. And that's not why, it's why I don't do a two minute treatment and see 85 patients a day because mm -hmm. that's only part of the equation. You know, what are you going to do to address the muscle tightness, the muscle weakness? What tools are you going to use to do that? What home correctives are you going to give the patient to lock in any neurological kind of, I like to describe it as an opening the neurological window when you're treating somebody, whether that's through soft tissue or manipulation or mobs with movement, some mulligan stuff with, you know, I do a ton of foot and ankle stuff. So I find mulligan stuff to be the best tool for improving ankle dorsiflexion. I love it. I do it like every day. And what do you do? Do you give them a needle wall drill to lock in that dorsiflexion improvement or something along those lines? So 
I agree with you 110%. That is the biggest issue with the profession. But hopefully, people like me, uh, not that I'm some you know, magical person, but uh, uh, the more times I get in front of a crowd teaching people different you know, sports medicine topics and lecturing, hopefully we can convert a couple of people here, a couple of people there. Uh, hopefully we're going down the right road. And do you feel that that um, outlook that, let's say, physical therapists or maybe even physicians or the general public have on chiropractors, do you feel like that's something that holds you back from having a bigger seat at the table? 100%. Absolutely. It's, mm -hmm. it, and I think, I think I, I don't know why exactly, but like I said, 20 years ago when I was going through school and getting out of school, really the balance was, or the, or the uh, the butting of heads was Kairos and MDs. You know, it was this long standing and, and rightfully so, you know, if you go back decades, there was a successful lawsuit with the American Chiropractic Association suing uh, the AMA because basically they were slandering the entire profession. Now we're going back decades. So I'm not you know, bringing up new stuff. Um, and they just said they were basically being taught to say, not refer or bad mouth Cairo. And so they took them to court and they won. Now, that's been a battle ever since. But like I said, in my last 18 years of practice, it has changed 180 degrees. I very rarely get any feedback or pushback from MDs anymore. We've somehow warmed a little bit to them. Um, and part of that is just in your own hometown. I've been, I like thinking doing a, a, a good job an above average job working on patients and patients go back to their primary and speak highly and say, hey, he helped me with this. He helped me with that. So part of that's just a one-on-one -on -one building your reputation. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is definitely shifted to more PT Cairo um, butting of heads. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. And and I, it's interesting. I think oftentimes we get stuck in these silos and we can't look yeah. – peek out to say, well, because it sounds like what you're doing is what I do. Exactly. And, and I don't know if it's just having more of a scarcity mindset of like the chiros are stealing our patients or the chiros are doing this when in fact you can work together um, right. for the betterment of your patients. And, you know, uh, we're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor in a minute. But before we do that, I, I just wanted to mention... Um, how you said, you know, as a profession, we look at the APTA and they're so organized and you guys have this uh, lobbying power, which I think we do. But as PTs, we look at you guys and think, well, Kairos, they just graduate from school and open up their own practice. Whereas physical therapists, we feel like we have to do work for a little bit or we don't feel prepared or, or we don't feel like we can open up our own practice and we're not top marketing and Kairos get all this marketing when they're in school and we don't get any of that. So I think there's you know, if we can kind of take those two parts of the profession that, that what you see our profession doing well and we see your profession doing well and, and kind of blend them together, then I think we'd be a really strong medical team. Yeah, and if I have a quick second before the break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just find out, you, you know, I'm smiling as you're speaking because I, what you're telling me is crazy. Now, I only have my own experience with my chiropractic school, and I went to a very well-respected evidence-based, science-based school up in uh, Minneapolis. Um, we get none of that. Like, when I graduated from school, I had no clue how to run a business. I worked for a couple of docs down in Long Island for like a year and a half. I worked for a doc up here in Plattsburgh for a while. Um, so I had no business acumen. I had no clue. We, get, we got no marketing. You know, maybe that's changed. Again, I was school a while ago. Um, I, I felt the exact same things you felt. So it's just kind of funny how we get into these silos and everything is All relative. These, these myths don't seem to be that mythical, do they? I, isn't it crazy? It's like, yeah. I know, it's like breaking bread at the table. And, and it's, it's my favorite part of what I lecture and travel around the country is talking, sitting. Sometimes you get invited to go out to dinner, you know, and, and it's doing this conversation across the table. And you find out after a couple of beers, you're like, Hey, I kind of like you and you're a PT. God, you know, what, what are we doing? And, and why is it like 98% of what we do in clinics sound exactly the same? Um, so we, I think both professions, the, the takeaway is we have our outliers that are doing weird, wacky things mm -hmm. that aren't in evidence, but the, the good people in both professions, I think, share 98% of the same skill set and the same philosophies and belief. And as an interesting tie-in to after the break, I think that's what draws me to high-level sports so much. 
Yeah, and we will, after, we're going to take a quick break right now to hear from our sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to talk about how, as you get to the elite levels, what happens to all of these myths and, and headbutting. So everyone stay tuned. We'll be right back. Are you interested in a free opportunity to check in with the latest thoughts of other rehab leaders? Well, I've got one for you. There's a new online rehab therapy community designed for the intersection of the clinical and business sides of rehab. It's the Rehab Therapy Operational Best Practices Forum. Catchy name, right? It's all about habits and initiatives that juice up your attendance, revenue, workflows, documentation, compliance, efficiency, and engagement while allowing your provider teams to keep their eye on the prize, their patients and outcomes. I personally believe that a better connected rehab therapy profession has the power to help more people. Jump in, subscribe, and join the conversation today. You can find the Rehab Therapy Operational Best Practices Forum at www.nethealth.com slash healthy. And we are back. So (laughs) we ended... Uh, before the break, talking about differences and similarities between chiros and physical therapists. But Jonathan, let's now talk about what happens to those differences and similarities as you keep moving up uh, the ladder in treating more and more elite athletes. Yeah, the differences get slimmer and slimmer. That's the simplest way I can put it. Um, you know, my highest level of, 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 I guess, professional achievement was probably working the Olympic Games um, in London. And it was a unique experience because I was working with the track cyclists. So, you know, track cycling is nothing in the States, um, popularity-wise. It is absolutely an enormous sport in most parts of the world. In fact, in the London Games, the venue for the velodrome, the indoor, you know, track, that's sold out before any other venue once tickets are Amazing. Were it's now, kind of like things like handball, right? Yeah, Not right. that popular here, but wildly popular in other parts of yeah. the world. Yeah. And, and so, you know, the Aussies, the New Zealanders, the most of Europe, uh, Germany and, and the UK ended up winning like 75% of the track cycling medals in their home Olympics. So that didn't hurt the popularity. Um, but for me, I basically spent the year traveling with this team. So I was based out of Plattsburgh, but I would go and cover their World Cup events and, you know, down in Colombia, uh, through Europe, and then basically a pretty much a full month in London in the village with them every day. And there's a lot of downtime. If you've ever worked with sport, you know, it sounds glamorous. It rarely is. You know, you're usually staying in crappy hotel rooms. You're, you're treating people from six in the morning before breakfast to, you know, I've treated, you know, bobsledders, these gigantic, 240 pound bobsledders in a hotel hallway trying not to wake up other people. I've treated people in bathrooms for crying out loud. So it is not always glamorous. Um, but there is a lot of downtime when they're on the track training or competing, you're just kind of sitting around. And what I found the, the coolest part of that, especially in the velodrome, because we set up in the infield. So each of us have our, each country has their own little corral where they, the mechanics are and the, and the physios and all this. And I'm just standing around with my little portable table and you're two feet, 10 feet, 15 feet from five different countries. And I start to watch what is the, what is that physio doing from the UK on that athlete? What is the uh, osteopath from Belgium uh, that I got to know a little bit? What is he? That's kind of a cool thing. I've never seen that technique before. What is he doing over there? And then going over and picking their brains. Um, And, and exactly as we were talking before the break, that the more I watch these people, the more similarities I have with them, that they're doing the same types of muscle work. They're doing the manipulation. Now, I'm not saying I still will take my manipulation, you know, spine manipulation, joint manipulation skills against anybody. It's what I do all day. So I may be a little better adjuster uh, than a physio might be, but the physio is going to be way better at other types of joint mobs or, uh, you know, things that I just don't do as much as with as much regularity. And so there was an interesting interaction the women's New Zealand team had a woman physio that was mainly responsible for the women. And I took care of the men and she was a little hesitant. Cairo internationally is not as integrated as it is in North America, period. They, they're, they're there, but it's not as accepted as part of a sports med team. Um, you go to any big event in Canada or the U S there will be a Cairo or more on staff with the physio and with the athletic trainers it is very physio driven 
in most parts of the world. Yes, um, that is very true. Yes. Yeah. And so this woman was very hesitant. I'd never met her before we started training together. And there we are two feet away with our own little tables. And she was dry needling. This is back in 2011, 2012. I'd never seen dry needling before. I still can't do it legally in New York. Um, I don't think you guys can either, can you? So okay. yeah, it's, it stinks because it's really cool and has some effective uses, I think. But I'm sending some of my guys over to try her dry needling with a couple issues that weren't responding to my toolbox. And you know, by the end of the tour, she had warmed up to me where she was sending some of the girls over to kind of work on that SI joint or the lumbar or the little stuck neck that she was having trouble with. And uh, we just kind of, again, that mending of bridges, but we did that through good work. She saw that I was helping. She thought that I wasn't a, a wing nut doing these, you know, waving crystals over their head or mm -hmm. something wacky. And so you just, you, like we said at the beginning, you, you treat people well, you, you, you have a good skill set and things tend to work out. Yeah. So it sounds to me like when you get up to that elite level, you're really working with very elite colleagues. Yeah. So when you're at that elite level of athletes, you're working with elite colleagues and you're hopefully you're evidence-based and you're there with um, armed with the right things for your, for your athletes. Yeah. I think it's self-limiting. Yeah. You know, that's what's kind of yeah. cool with the process. As you go up and work a little bigger event or a little different sport, if you're doing wacky stuff. Um, you're not going to last. No, no, in my opinion. I mean, there's some that sneak through. It still amazes me when I, you know, hear some professional teams. I hear who's working or who was hired as this team physio or team Cairo. And I'm like, man, they are, that's an interesting choice. So, you know, there, there, there are some people that slip through the crack, but I think as a rule, absolutely. It, it, it kind of, you get ruled out pretty early. Yeah. Yeah. And which, which makes perfect sense to me. And now, you know, you've been around elite athletes from a lot of different sports from winter Olympics to summer Olympics and, and world championships. So what are some of the key traits that you've seen in these high level athletes that maybe the listeners can use to improve, whether it be their life or their training. Um, what, what do you have to share? Two things. Um, one kind of surprising and one maybe not surprising. I think that the, the one thing that's amazed me spending like a lot of time with these, with these athletes on the road where you're at meals with them, you're watching TV with them. They're showing you, you know, you're watching Netflix with them and stuff and, and treating them. It's, I like to joke. It's like the minute they lay down on my table, I feel like I've switched into like half psychiatry mode. You know, they're just getting out all their worries, the races in the morning. And this, the thing that amazes me is how mentally fragile a lot of these athletes are just like you and I, you know, I'd like to, I'm still a, a decent, I try to be a decent athlete and I you know, do these obstacle races and, you know, ultra marathon, all this kind of stuff to stay fit. And these guys and girls are, are expressing the same nervousness and frustrations and worries in a lot of cases that I'm thinking the night before my stupid local Turkey trot 5k, you know, and I'm like, you would have thought to, these are Olympic medal winners in some cases and they're still as kind of batty in the mind as, as you know, the, the middle school track athlete you might well, treat in your There's still people, right? right? And I think if they didn't have that, I, yeah. I look that as, as the, as um, more like they, they care so much yeah. that they're not going out there being this like overconfident. Yeah sort of macho person, but that instead they care so much about whether it be their performance, their team's performance, the country's performance, that they get nervous. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they have even more writing on the right because there might be sponsorship pressures. You know, if they don't do well, they're losing money, they're losing sponsors, they're losing this. There's pressures from the national governing bodies. You know, they're trying to qualify to be on the team the next year. So, yeah, it's just crazy. So it, that was just always that always amazes me and kind of interests me when I have these discussions. Now, the other thing, um, and it's probably the world's most boring tip, but it's the one consistent thing I've seen across all sports, all genders, all disciplines is show up every day. Meaning it doesn't have to be exciting. It's the people who, who improve from month to month and year to year over, you know, we in Olympic world, we talk about these 
quadrennials, these four year plans between Olympic games. These athletes are planning four year blocks and then micro planning one year of each of those four and then monthly within the year. And so, but what it is, it's a long term commitment in the, in the world of Olympics. I mean, you're four years of pressure and training and the ones that do the best are the ones that stay healthy. It's the people that, you know, you can train your butt off for two or three months. Oh, then you tweak your Achilles. You're out for a month. Then you ramp up again. Oh, and then it's your low back you tweak. And so you don't ever see that consistent build over one to four years. It's the people that show up every day and do the work that's required, whether that's in the, the medical room, getting you know work done, doing foam rolling, whatever it is they do to maintain their mobility and stuff and stay healthy. It's the showing up. And I'm proud, you know, I've tried to take that lesson back professionally and I tell students when I see them and, and high school kids that I'm treating and we're talking stuff when you're working on them on the table is just show up, whether that's showing up for class in college, you know, even if you're not even think you're paying attention, these the college kids kill me and wonder why they don't do well on tests. I'm like, just show up. You're paying to be there. Just show up and kind of osmose it in, you know, whatever the teacher's saying. And I, my, of all the stuff I've been lucky enough to do, my proudest professional stat is that in 18 years of clinic, I have never missed a day of work in 18 years. Never. Through blizzard, through sickness, through nothing. I've never missed a day of scheduled work. And that, I think, is a lesson to be learned, is if you just show up and do the work day in and day out, the luck tends to find you, whether you're an athlete or a clinician. And going back to when you said you have these high level elite athletes and they get just as nervous as you or yeah. I would, did you find anything that they did that helped them? Like, do you have any, maybe a tip that, that maybe they used to help with their mental space that you can share with the listeners? Yeah. You know, and everyone's so different. So I, I hate to, this is a tough yeah, one. Yeah, it's just, just like one thing. Routine. It's routines, um, whether it's a going to bed routine, a getting up routine, a race day morning routine, a nutritional routine, uh, putting the stupid left shoe on before the right shoe, call it what you want. Um, but it's routine because that it's funny you say that that last few months in Europe before the, the London Olympics, one of our, we we're a small team. It was like five or six athletes and myself and the coaches, the mechanics, and we had a full-time sports psychologist on staff. So I got to sit in, he would actually do some of his mental kind of training and talk down and talk up type work while I was working on the athletes in the evening. If we were doing some massage or something, he'd go in and kind of say, Hey, what's on your mind? What are you thinking about for tomorrow? So it was kind of cool to see the sports psychs focus so much on this routine as well is just creating something where when chaos is happening around them on race day, their nerves are on an 11 out of 10 Six thousand people screaming in the velodrome before their, you know, gold medal or bronze medal race. What do they have that they can go back to mentally that gives them some control and some comfort? And that might be mixing up their own protein drink or their energy drink. It might be doing a foam rolling mobility session where they know they do this for this many minutes. Whatever it is, it's routine. And you know, not to plug my own show here, but. <laughs> Uh, I just had an episode on that exact thing, on how to set yourself up for success by having a solid morning routine yes. with, with uh, Steph Lagana. And it's true. I've, like, I've started my morning routine, I don't know, maybe two years ago. And mm -hmm. it's made a huge difference in how I get up in the morning, how I show up for the day. And if there's a day where I'm like, oh, screw it, I'm not getting up, I'm not going to do this, I'm... My day is so much less productive. Yeah. Well, and to tie in, my own personal, you can tell I'm a little OCD. I, I get into these streaks. You know, I never miss work. I work out. I try to work out every day. My thing I've been doing now for well, over two and a half years, I do a minimum 60-second ice-cold shower first thing in the morning. I end one shower a morning. You know, my, my morning shower, I finish on ice-cold water. Now, up here in Plattsburgh, for six months a year, that yeah, no is thanks. like 40-something <laughs> degree water. But... The thing I tell, and you know, there's all kinds of this Wim Hof stuff, and there's some interesting potential um, you know, immunity circulation benefits. I don't even worry about that. The reason I find it is one, it's part of a routine. It's like that my day has officially started when I suck it up and 
do that 60 seconds of cold shower. But what I find of it is it's getting comfortable doing something uncomfortable. I, I think it is such a life lesson. You know, I'm kind of a, a realist by nature and life sucks sometimes, man. You know, a, a good, yeah. chunk of, good chunk of being an adult is doing a bunch of crap that sucks. Yeah, you don't adulting, do. adulting does yeah. suck. Yeah. And so, you know, it's like that is one way I can say, hey, there is nothing worse on a 20 below day up here after I get back from a run and I'm in a steamy hot shower and I'm staring at that stupid knob, trying to psych myself up to crank it to cold. And there's something about just overcoming and saying, all right, boom, done it. I feel better now that I did and kind of move on with the day. So it works for me. <laughs> well, I, I applaud that. And I'm glad that as part of your routine, I would never be able to do it. I don't right. think, maybe not for 60 seconds, maybe for like 10. Start with 10. You can build up to like a one month plan. Up. A great, a graded, graded exposure to ice cold showers in the morning. Um, you city folk, you city folk, that cold water doesn't get that cold down there anyway. Come on. <laughs> it, it, it gets a little chilly. Um, all right. So before we wrap things up here, what would you like the listeners to take away from our discussion today? Maybe two or three big takeaways. Well, if you're a practitioner, you know, whether it's Cairo, or physio, or athletic trainer, massage, whatever it is, I think the takeaway from both of just you and I having this talk should be don't make preconceived notions about fellow clinicians until you know for sure. You know what I mean? Don't assume because patients see in a physio or because a patient see in a chiro. Don't assume that they're going to see some crazy person that's going to do wacky stuff. Now, they might very well, but I just I think we're, it's a win if we can at least let people a little bit of an open mind until they can prove it otherwise. Um, for the non-clinicians, I think it comes down to what we were just talking about is just one, creating a routine and getting in the habit of just showing up every day um, there's, you know, you do that day in and day out. And like I said, the, the good luck and the good things tend to find you if you do that. Awesome. And then last question that I ask everyone, and that is knowing where you are now in your life and in your career, what advice would you give to yourself as a new grad 18 years ago? This is give wow. advice to yourself, not to yeah. someone else. Um, I would have, I would have traveled more young. That's it. I, I have two kids Two Well, my daughter will be a teenager in two weeks. So I've got a 14 and an almost 13 year old. And I've started forcing myself to travel more again with them um, before they get old and don't want to talk to me anymore. Um, which we're getting, we're getting close. Yeah. Um, you're, you're, you're almost there. I'm, I'm partially there with one yeah. of them, but yeah. um, it's travel young. And now I've been lucky enough to be in, I don't know, 25, 26 countries and which isn't a ton, but it's, it's more than most. And I just wish I would have started in my, you know, 18, 20, 22. Um, so travel more when you're young, even if you can't afford it, figure out a way to do it. Great advice. Get open up your mind, open up your eyes, see the world, see other cultures. It'll only enrich you in the future. So great advice. And now where can people find out more about you if they want to reach out? Yeah, you know, the easiest way is probably through my clinic uh, website, which is simply um, theidealathlete.com, just all one word that goes right to my office page. Um, and you can reach out to me via the contact page there. Uh, you can also reach me on Facebook. Um, my office page is The Ideal Athlete, um, Ideal Athlete Chiropractic. Um, and through my clinic page, if you want, I, I do do a lot of um, online consultations and phone consultations and Skype. So if you are a runner or an athlete, you know, struggling with something and want to reach out, you can, you can do that right through my webpage. Awesome. And we will have links to all of that in the show notes at podcast.healthywealthysmart.com. So if anyone wants to get in touch with Jonathan, they want him to come and maybe I could see you now speaking on some other podcasts and things like that, which would be awesome. Uh, or if you have any questions on working with those Olympic athletes and he, he maybe give you a little more detail as to his journey, um, definitely reach out to him and we'll have all the links at the podcast under this episode. So Jonathan, thanks so much for coming on and having a nice discussion. Yeah, it was awesome. Thanks for having me. Anytime. And everyone else, thank you so much for listening. Have a great couple of days and stay healthy, wealthy, and smart. Huge thank you to Dr. Jonathan Mulholland for a great discussion. And of course, thanks to our sponsors, NetHealth. So again, if you're interested in a free opportunity to check in with the latest thoughts of other rehab leaders, 
then there's a new online rehab therapy community designed for that. It is the intersection of clinical and business sides of rehab, and it's called the Rehab Therapy Operational Best Practices Forum. It's all about habits and initiatives that juice up your attendance, revenue, workflows, documentation, compliance, efficiency, and engagement, pretty much everything you need when you own a business. You'll see stats on community members already involved, plus polls, surveys, benchmarking calculators, videos, podcasts, and more. So if you want to join the Rehab Therapy Operational Best Practices Forum for free, go to nethealth.com slash healthy. Thank you for listening, and please subscribe to the podcast at podcast.healthywealthysmart.com. And don't forget to follow us on social media. 